I'm going to be talking about multiple plastic traits that predict assortative mating by developmental environment. And this is a study that I did in collaboration with Amy Ronk at Winona State University and Will Schoenberger, who is a graduate student of mine. So assertive mating is prevalent and it has large impacts on a range of ecological and evolutionary processes. For some reason, I think the timing, there's like a timing thing for this. So I'm not sure how to stop that. Um, from trade evolution to the formation of reproductive isolation and lineage diversification. And in the early stages of diversification, assertive mating by the environment can contribute to ecological divergence in the face of gene flow. And because of its importance to these um, processes, researchers have been tackling several big questions related to assortative mating, including how does assortative mating arise? How does trait diversity interact with and contribute to assertive mating? And what are the consequences for population genetic structure? And a lot of these questions to date, um, people have focused on in terms of genetic traits. But here we're going to be asking if developmental plasticity can generate assertive mating by environment. And developmental plasticity is changes in an organism's phenotype due to exposure to different environmental conditions during development. So for example, you could have good food during development and turn into a large individual. You could have bad food during development and turn into a small individual. And if you have mating based on size, you could have a sort of mating um, by developmental environment. So there are several processes by which developmental plasticity can generate a sort of mating by environment. First, you can have shifts in phenology. So on the y-axis here, we have the number of individuals in a population that mature. And on the um, x-axis, we have the days since hatching. And environment one, you can have, um, does anyone know how to pause the, this is getting a little frustrating. Um, let me just see if I can. Um, so individuals are maturing earlier in environment one and in environment two, individuals are maturing later. And that means that their mating periods are non-overlapping. And so you can have a reduction in the overlap of available potential mates from different environments. And so that can generate a sort of mating by environment. You can also have induced habitat preference for feeding and mating. And if you prefer to feed and mate where you grew up, that means that you have increased encounters with potential mates that grew up in the same environment as you. You can also have plasticity and sexual signals and preferences. So here we have signals and preference phenotype on the y-axis. And in environment one, you have male signals and female preferences that are high in value in environment two, you have them low in value. And this means that there's increased preference for potential mates that grew up in the same environment. So we are asking questions about these different mechanisms that relate to um, developmental plasticity and assortative mating in the keeled tree hopper Antilia carinata. So this is a super common tree hopper in North America. It's distributed from Panama to Canada. It lives in prairies and a lot of fragmented habitat patches. In the focal field site, it lives on three host plant species. Um, this is cup plant, coneflower, and thistle. And they spend their entire lifetime on the plant, including laying eggs. The sessile juveniles develop and feed on the plant from which they hatched. And adults feed, live, sexually signal, and mate on the plant. So here you have a male on the right and a female on the left. And the males use vibrational signals. So I don't have to tell this crowd um, that these travel through bending waves through the plants and um, female responses and the ensuing duets are what leads to pair formation. <laughs> So what we did was we assessed population genomic structure using genotype by sequencing. We did a rearing experiment that looked at the effects of plant species on life history traits. And then we also tested um, plasticity in several traits that contri contribute to patterns of mating. 
So we use a double digest um, for genotyping by sequencing for 76 individuals, which yielded almost 6,000 SNPs. We did a clustering analysis and the program structure and determined the optimal number of genetic clusters using the Avano method. What we found was that the optimal number of clusters is two, so that means that two genetic groups is the best explanation of genetic variation in the population. And what this looks like graphically is you have the proportion assignment to each of the two genetic clusters on the y-axis and individuals from each of the three um, host plants on the x-axis. And what you see here is that coneflower and cut plant are a lot more similar. Individuals there are assigned to the same genetic cluster most of the time, and thistle individuals from thistle look quite different. And when you look at pairwise FST values, what you see is that um, between cup plant and coneflower, individuals have very little genetic differences between them. Um, and there's much greater genetic differences between individuals on cup plant and thistle and between individuals from coneflower and thistle. So we know that there's genetic structure in the population according to host plant. This may reflect assortative mating, but what we next did was we did a rearing experiment where we looked at the effects of plant species on several life history traits. Um, I don't have time to show you that's those studies, but essentially there was no cost of switching from a natal plant species to another plant species. So if you were born on one plant, it didn't matter if you were switched to a different plant species but survivorship, adult weight, and maturation times varied across those um, plant species. So next we did a large rearing experiment where we looked at the effects of plant species on traits that can contribute to patterns of mating. We collected individuals in the field as first and second instar nymphs. Um, so here is um, the underside of the plant. Females lay their eggs in the ribs. We had almost 1,400 individuals that we took from what I'm going to call the natal plant species. So we just focused on two plants here, coneflower and thistle. And we took cohorts of 20 nymphs and placed them on what I'm going to refer to as the developmental plant species. So that's half of the individuals from coneflower were placed on coneflower and the other half were placed on thistle. And that was repeated for individuals that were born on thistle. We reared them in the greenhouse and to test for phenology, we tracked maturation across um, different developmental plant species. We then tested feeding preference in the lab. So we placed three females on a plant, um, two plants that were touching with leaves. We allowed the individuals to sample both plants. Most of these individuals did in fact sample both plants and decisions in terms of where they wanted to feed and settle down was made within a few days. So a decision was considered when they stayed on one plant for three days. And after that point, only one and a half percent of individuals switched. Next, we looked at um, signaling preference. So we placed individuals on um, as adults on either coneflower or thistle, we played back a vibrational primer and determined if they responded to that primer. So if the male produced a call or the female produced a response call. And we monitored these signals and um, looked at whether or not they responded. To look at plasticity and sexual signals, we measured the dominant signal frequency of males that signaled on either of the plant species. So these um, signals have this uh, original kind of like duh, 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 and then they have these frequency sweeps so they go do 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 and we measure the dominant signal frequency of these um, frequency sweeps at a standardized position. So it turns out because these are fairly pure tone they're relatively unaffected by transmission through the plant. Um, so for our results, for shifts in phenology, what we found was that insects matured earlier when they were reared on thistle. So here's the proportion of individuals that were adult in the days since the experiment started. So you have in purple individuals reared on thistle and in gray individuals reared on cone. And what you see here is that on thistle, they started maturing earlier. 
So there was a large effect of developmental plant species. And in fact, natal plant species had no effect um, on adult maturation. We then found that insects preferred to feed and signal on their developmental plant species. So on the y-axis here, we have the proportion that prefer the developmental plant species. And here are individuals that were reared on cone and individuals that were reared on thistle. And I have this dotted line here, the proportion expected to feed on one plant or the other if there's no preference. And what we find is that 75% of individuals are preferring to feed on the plant that they developed on. So there's a large effect of developmental plant species. There's also a small effect of natal plant species. We also looked at signaling preference. Um, and here are individuals that were reared on cone and tested on cone. Almost 80% of them actually called on cone. And for individuals that were reared on thistle and tested on thistle, over 80% um, signaled on thistle. And when we compare that to individuals that were reared on cone and tested on thistle, um, or individuals that were reared on thistle and tested on cone here in the white bars, what we find is that um, they're almost three times more likely to signal on the developmental plant species than the plant species that they did not develop on. So we also looked at plasticity and sexual signals. So here we have the dominant signal frequency on the y-axis and individuals that developed on cone and thistle. And what we find is that um, there's a shift in the dominant signal frequency across developmental plant species. So we also find no um, impact on natal plant species and there's no effect on signaling species. So the dominant signal frequency does not change whether or not they are recorded on a cone flower or a thistle plant. So we actually are really interested in whether or not plant transmission properties are what's driving this pattern. And if you want to learn more about that, um, Rowan McGinley, who's a postdoc in my lab, is giving a talk tomorrow about how transmission through um, plants can shape insect vibrational signals. So to summarize the results, what we found was population genomic structure reflects plant species use by individuals, and developmental plant species had a strong effect on all traits measured. So that includes life history, adult weight, um, and then all of the traits that could contribute to a sort of mating. And so we found evidence that three plasticity-based mechanisms could generate a sort of mating by environment. We found shifts in phenology where individuals that were reared on thistle are maturing earlier and so are gonna be more likely to encounter other individuals that were reared on thistle when they're ready to mate. We also found induced habitat preference. So individuals preferred to both feed and sexually signal on the, the plant species on which they developed. And finally, we found plasticity and sexual signals. And currently what we're doing is we're looking at whether or not there's plasticity also in female preferences. So stay, stay tuned for that. So I wanna give some acknowledgements. Um, Jen Hamill in particular has been really critical in um, discussion and brainstorming and she's collaborating on some um, resulting projects from this work. And then I also want to give a plug because there's actually more to the story than what I have indicated here um, that I've reported on. It turns out that the degree of plasticity and the degree of heterogeneity in the developmental environment varies seasonally. So we find stronger patterns later in the season. And so overall, this is a really exciting system to explore mechanisms by which developmental plasticity can generate a sort of mating with consequences for population genomic structure, and also a system in which this is temporally variable. So if you're interested in this work or other um, stuff that I do in the lab, I'd love to recruit folks to come work in the lab. And with that, I will take any questions.